servant of patience and he digged up his name to me and I had to just chill. I was like, he's, I was like, oh, I thought I was going to be reading the nine, but I met the servant of patience. He was on at seven. So I'm like, oh, well, I guess I should sit back. <laughs> <laughs> James Hampton the third is here, ladies and gentlemen, and he is going to be sharing his story uh, with us this evening. He's been sitting in uh, all night long up from uh, Mississippi. Yeah. Uh, now, what, what do you do down there? I write, and I read, and I go to the library, and I handle business in that way. There you go. That's what's up, man. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Now, would you consider yourself an Afrofuturist? Yes. Certainly. I'm an African, and I'm a black African, and I'm a black African from America, and I live in the present. But I'm not denied the future by no way or means am I denied in the future. I am there, and no one can keep me out of it. Damn right. Well, damn it. Well, he sounds right. like an Afrofuturist to me. <laughs> All right. So now the story you're going to share with us uh, needs no introduction, but tell people really quick the, the title of it one more time. The title is The Fantastic Story About Octavia. And the tale with the title at the end. I didn't think a whole lot about it. I just wrote what it was. All right. Well, then, by all means, we will drop all mics and we will turn our attention to James Hampton the third here in Octavia City. Here goes the story. I met Octavia at the beginning of November as I walked through the park across from the little library around 48th and Budlow. That's in Los Angeles. The year was 2013. Right now, some readers, listeners this time, might be thinking the same thing that I was thinking at the time. So I had better just stick to the facts. Octavia was leaning against the opposite side of a big white oak so that I could not see her until I was almost past it. She had a newspaper tucked under her arm and she was looking up at the leaves of the big oak as a child looks up at a parent after that child has asked an utterly unanswerable question. I recognized her immediately because I had seen her picture in a display that some librarian had put up around the time of her death, almost eight years before. Without bragging, I can say that I have a pretty spectacular memory for faces, and it is accurate. Facial recognition software has got nothing on the wet wear of my cerebral. We made eye contact. I could tell immediately that she knew that I recognized her. I blurted out, but you're dead. A good memory I have, tact I do not. Now at this point, readers or listeners in this case might expect her to smile, to coolly explain or to spin one of the yarns that we all so enjoy. That did not happen. What I saw on her handsome face was shock, utter shock. It took about two seconds for her to regain her composure. And then she asked coolly without a hint, with a hint of a smirk. She asked me, when did I die? I hesitated. Yeah. Never mind, she said. I said, so you're not fresh from heaven or something like in Book of Martha? She said, what is Book of Martha? Never mind, I said. My mind started to wander into infinite possibilities. Look, I'm not a ghost, she said. I've been a writer all my life in Ponji. That's who she called me. She called me in Ponji. My characters come to life for me. I sent Edana into the past. When she got back, she sent me to the future. In an instant, it made sense to me. She came to 2013 from the past, sometime after she had written Kindred, but before she wrote one of my all-time favorite short stories, that's Book of Martha, I might have mentioned it, I could not even feign disbelief. I had no problem accepting the fact that one of the greatest authors of science fiction was a time traveler standing right in front of me. What threw me was that she called me by the name of a character in a short story that I wrote but couldn't get published. I asked her, how do you know that name? I know that name and I know your real name. And I know that if I use your real name, you can't use it for the byline on the story you're going to write about this meeting of ours. And that's how she blew my mind and was left of my mind of my mind. 
I reached into my little bag. I wore my back and pulled out my blue, uh, my blue thermos. It was full of cheap brandy sweetened with a little grape juice from concentrate. I took a swig and offered it to Octavia. To my eternal gra gratitude, she grabbed the container, sniffed it, smiled, and took a drink. I leaned beside her against the, tr tr the trunk of our shade giver. We just naturally slid down and took a seat on separate roots of that kindly oak. So tell me a story. Edana said that you had a pretty good one. That's what she said to me. I said, how does she know that? How does she know me? You read about her life, she read about yours. We know that you discover that even though you live in the real world, you're just a character in a short story. And even though that makes you a pathetically unsuccessful author here, you know that nobody ever listens to or puts in print. They, you know, they barely stick around to, you know, to listen to you late at night after, you know, you came on the radio show. It makes you something of a legend where she lives. And she and I both like your work. So let's hear the latest story. I guess it's more of a tale. That's what I said. It'll never get published. But she interrupted me. She said, just tell the damn story. I said, all right. This is what I told her. This is the story I told her. Once upon the land of Mississippi, there was a time shortly after the surrender of the Confederation of Treasonous States when the Marster, as it was typically pronounced there, of a rather large plantation was compelled to announce to the men, women, and children who had been forced to view themselves as his chattel that they were now to consider themselves free. Most of them had been so thoroughly enslaved that the concept of freedom was utterly alien. Many decided to go on working at the plantation, the only home they had ever known. They reasoned quite rightly that since they owned nothing but themselves, and that only recently, their prospects would be pretty bleak in a society that despised them now more than ever. But not Jack. Like most of the newly freed of that place, Jack had no great hatred for the old master. He was a good enough man relative to his type. But he longed, this Jack now, Jack longed to stretch his legs, so to speak. He more than most of his kindred in bondage felt keenly the oppression of the patterollers who served their society by shackling, beating, and returning any one of his kind caught away from home without a written pass from their master. The patterollers' violence against women and brutal lust for punishing men more manly than themselves had irked him since his first encounter with that tribe. Jack's best friend on the plantation was Will, and he shared Jack's wanderlust. Many a time in slavery times, Jack and Will had crept off to clandestine parties out in some secret cabin or deserted barn where they could sing, dance, and mix with the complimentary sex. <clears throat> where they could sing, dance, and mix with the complimentary sex and not be heard by the ones who claimed ownership of their bodies. They loved these gatherings and could hardly miss one if they wanted to because Will was well known as the best in the county on the fiddle and Jack was the undisputed king of calling figures. You know, rhymes to dance to, that's calling figures. Somebody would pass him in the field and say something like, we're going to hullabaloo. Tonight, see if you can't bring the fire. They would say that because before matches, fire was kind of hard to come by on the plantation, and it was most convenient to carry a few live, co live coals in a pail or a pot so that you could light the lantern at the party. But at one particular party, Jack not only brought the coals to light the lantern, he also called out figures so good that the party go goer said he must have carried that fire for the lantern here in his mouth. So when the recently freed folk heard that Jack and Will were leaving the land of their birth, they prevailed upon them to come to one last hullabaloo to see if they could set the roof on fire without a cold one more time. Jack and Will couldn't say no. They would just party till the women got loose, hold some close, kiss them goodbye, and be headed to Gainesville before the sun woke up. There they could get a good job on a boat hauling lumber up the river to Bay St. Louis. The plan went right on schedule. That night, Will brought the fiddle, and Jack brought the fire, and the lantern was turned down low by the time they started kissing on the women. 
and that is the point where the tragedy struck. The white caps busted in on them, vicious, well-armed, and full of liquor. They were not members of that well-known clan known for the white hoods. They were the same old patter rollers from slavery time, just refusing to accept that they were out of their jobs. And that's when the lantern went all the way out and brown skinned bodies were running every which way. Some were climbing in the direction of open windows. I hear that some took off and flew right over the head of those, that gang of patter rollers. Somehow or another, Jack and Will got away without much trouble. They were veterans to the game and they they were well on their way to Gainesville and the sun would not even be dressed in sky blue for at least two more hours. They were walking through the moonlit woods and feeling some kind of good. Maybe this was freedom. They got to jabbering at each other the way they tended to do. Will was talking about how fine his woman was to look at and Jack countered that while Will's woman might have been easier on the eyes, Jack thought he his was sure easier easier on the hands. And if there's a moral to this fable, then maybe it is that it's time to put the pretty versus shapely debate between brothers and tomcatting to rest. Because if they had not been so engaged in bragging on their women's looks and feels, they would have never got caught slipping the way they did. They split instinctively when they heard the horse whinny, but they had already let the paterolas get too close. They had surrounded them. Some were on foot and they were closing in slow and slick like. There was barely five foot of space between the two that Jack split. He ducked the club of one and he dodged the club of the other. One day a distant relative of Jack's would set the SEC record for rushing yardage, but I'm digressing from the tale, sorry. <clears throat> Jack got lucky, but Will got caught. Will, he never cried out or prayed or begged when they put that cat of 99 tails on his back. He just died. And when they found him the next morning, still standing, naked, and hugging that oak tree, a set of shackles, and a chain connecting his wrists, his woman cried a sound that sounded like music, or the doorbell to the gates of heaven. And a little bird, that little bird recorded the melody, and he used it to pick up chicks. There weren't no copyright laws enforced on him. And that's the end of the story. It's called Jack of the Lantern and poor whipped wheel. Sometimes I call it whipped poor wheel. So you're going to put the title at the end like that? Octavia asked me. I said, yeah, I guess so if it's not too gimmicky. <laughs> she said, that's not a bad tale at all, Mpongi. She said that and then she kissed me right on the lips. The end. Wow. Wow. I really like that. Reminds me of a lot of story, like folklore based, like bro rabbit type stuff. Yeah, you know what I mean. Which is always cool when that when those elements of uh, Black American folklore get incorporated into Afrofuturism, because you can you, you do it through the whole time travel aspect and transcending linear time as we know it. Yeah. Um, plus, that, just that one moment when you know, what do you? When the character runs into Octavia Butler, like, you're dead. She goes, when did I die? And I'm like, never. She's still here. Right. She may not be physically here anymore, but she's definitely here. She's been here all month. Yeah. I, I love the story within the story thing. That's yeah. And the meta, you know, the whole thing. And and the and, um, Martha, Book of Martha is one of my favorite short yes. stories by her, too. So I love the whole just, ref well, I love all the references that you made. and the But the, that story in particular book of martha it's like the structure of your story sort of mirrored that you know i'm trying to, I'm trying to remember the the collection that that came in so i can big it up blood child quick. thank you blood child go get blood child on amazon or something that's a good read it's a lot of octavia short stories in that one that you'll surely enjoy Ooh, sure, blood, blood child. child yeah right that's what's going on that was cool man the, the, you're right like you said like that whole like brer Bro, rabbit, Bear rabbit, tar, 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 rabbit kind of stuff. It 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 reminded me, and and I don't know if it's the accent or, or or what have you, or a little bit of the you know the the draw, cadence. The, the cadence. Yeah. I, I was just sitting here, and I was just seeing like 
I was just seeing Richard Pryor sitting up on the stage doing mud ball. Oh, that's like, I you could, love Richard Pryor. I love me so Richard Pryor and mud ball, <laughs> man. And, and like I could see you, I could see like Mudbone doing that story, man. And I could, I could see you, like especially having seen like some of your pictures on Facebook, you know, like when you were at the Afrofuturist Affair, you know, and, and and everything like that. Just some, some like, like your whole vibe, your whole energy. I could just see you just sitting up there, just. Doing that, man. Just, perform, <laughs> just performing that, man. Like I could see, this is how dope that was. Like as I, I'm hearing that, I'm seeing Mudbone, and then somehow Mudbone became animated, and he became animated first in like the style of like, of like Fat Albert, because that's I guess like the most accessible in, in, in my head. But then it's as so you were so Philly up here. Well, okay, <laughs> but but you know what? But after that, but after that, it kind of morphed. Into almost like the, the the schoolhouse rock kind of feel. Well, not even schoolhouse rock. I I saw it more of like like long bodies with like a long torso, long long limbs, um, and then you know, you know whose artworks then started spell, speaking to me a fool Richardson. Mm. You know because I love a fool Richardson. Yeah, so, so a lot you know, of common ground here. It was a lot of things that I love. <laughs> <laughs> for what your story was doing to yeah, me, man. Mad. I'm not mad at none of those comparisons. I'm not mad at all, and I'm glad to hear about I appreciate it a lot, a lot. That was, it was, that was really cool, man. That was really dope, man. That was fine. Yes, sir. What was the inspiration besides the obvious? <laughs> yeah, the inspiration was this event. Uh, Octavia City was the inspiration mm -hmm. for the story. You know, as soon as I read, you know, what was going on, I started thinking about, you know, Octavia Butler, obviously, and uh, and I got a, and I got a, I got a story started. It started going, and then uh, and you know naturally I start going with a tail because that's normally mm -hmm. where I go. As mm -hmm. you might you might remember yeah. from the other one, that's normally where I go with it. And anybody who's seen you know the flash fiction on Facebook knows that I I fracture fairy tales for fun. Let's go. Who does more? Me, Rocky, or Bullwinkle? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> we fracture them for fun. What is it about the flash fiction format that attracts you? Yeah, it's because I can publish them myself because I can't get published these really? kind of stories right here in print. So I can publish the flash stuff myself via Facebook. Big ups to Facebook. Plus, sometimes you, you get one idea about something and you sit down to write it out and it just kind of takes its own shape and goes in its own direction and the best thing you can do sometimes is just let that unfurl and kind of hold on and then afterwards you end up having a story within a story or or a character develops in a way that you weren't it, planning on it you're just kind of like oh wow i like this choice for this kind of let this go and see what happens and so sometimes the best ones are just kind of written without a lot of thought just in the moment just putting it out there yo kennedy what happened to the story you read last time that's Oh, did you ever finish that? I didn't. Anything? I didn't. I didn't. Uh, that's because that took. I think that probably would have been the ending of that story. Um, I deliberated on that long and hard as to what part of those characters' lives I was going to start, and I, I feel like the main character served its purpose. Like, mm -hmm. so I feel like if I were to develop that any further, it would be. Uh, resignant. It would be going backwards. Mm. So it would be, you know, what led these people up to this point and, and the, that world and how it was built the way it was and, and all of that. I love um, that story. I really need to go back and look at that stuff. Yeah. I've been getting into um, almost a sidebar because we got a couple minutes to spare. Okay. Um, I like to do um, uh, character drills to kind of help help keep my chops. So if I don't have an idea that inspires a session, we could just crank it out and it just takes its own you know, flesh. I um, I, I like to think of a, a character archetype or a, or a character trait and like put it in a certain situation and and press the boundaries of that as much as possible, but in a really short format. So this way, to, like, as far as descriptions are concerned and prose is concerned, it forces you to go to places that you wouldn't normally go metaphorically. So that this way, your character gets fleshed out as much as possible in a short amount of time. And that drill turned into a series of drills between the main character and then a subsidiary character and then their world started to like build and collide yeah. and ended up uh, being a part of this other world that I had created for this other story that I just kind of left alone because you know, when you're writing a bunch of ideas and things kind of fall by the wayside right. um, 
but it managed to incorporate itself back into this world anyhow. So I'm kind of like scattered, which is completely against what the point of these drills were in the first place, you know? So I'm like, what stupid Gemini brain going all over the place? Um, but let me support flash fiction in general. Yeah. It's, 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 it's a really legit and uh, any any hypothetical publishers out there, flash fiction is legit. You can do a book of flash fiction and it'll be enjoyable, just like Aesop's fables are enjoyable. And flash fiction is legitimate as anything else. So writers write it. Uh, so called, you know, if if there are any publishers in existence, y'all, you know, publish it. There is a book of um, black sci-fi flash fiction called Possibilities that you can check out on Amazon. It's actually free. Um, that was put out in 2012 by a group of uh, black sci-fi writers. It should, be, it should be free, though. Somebody pay those people. Hey, that's what we've been talking about. Working for free is not right. <laughs> it's true. It depends. It depends on the goal. I mean, what have we been I think about? some things should be accessible, you know, and some things you got to make accessible it for is. people yeah, and yeah. open the door. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Plus, there's a lot of things and, and artists with, deserve to. to be paid for the work. Absolutely. No one's going to dispute you on that one. Um, Amen. But this day and age makes so much more, so much more accessible. So a lot of people, you know, in the comic industry, for instance, are tired of trying to get mainstream publishers to pay attention to their work. They're tired of trying to, you know, make up that decision, do I compromise so that they feel more comfortable with my work? Should I stick to my guns? You know, I want my story to be told the way I want it told, how I want it told. I don't feel that I should, you know, have to bend to anybody's overseers or, or white caps as you call them. Um, so they're going out there and they're and they're producing their own things and this way that they are able to maintain the artistic integrity of, of their stories. Um, we've gone to a bunch of conventions filled with people that have taken self-publishing into their own hands. Um, and with digital media being the way it is, you, you know, you can put a, get an ebook together, yeah, you know what I mean? Exactly. And not have to worry about printing and just, you know, having it downloadable through a certain or site. Print on, or print on demand. Let yeah. me say this, though. White, white caps are a real, were a real phenomenon in Mississippi. They, they aren't, you know, made up by me. They were taken directly from slave narratives. That's what they were called. And they weren't Ku Klux Klan members. They were drunk uh, ex patterollers And the patterollers were exactly as they were described in the tale by, you know, they were described by actual former slave or enslaved peoples, and that's exactly what they were called, and that was a real phenomenon. I believe it. But basically what I'm saying is, you have, there are so many more options, and so many more ways for you to... So I'm not calling publishers white caps, that's something different. You know, white, you know, white caps didn't have no job, but they steady did it. The publishers have a job, but they won't do it. Okay, so it's time for James. Yes. To become one with the Trouble Nation. It is. Now you've been sitting here all day, sir, and I'm sure you've been marinating on what your Trouble designation will be so that you can join the Trouble Nation. Well, the fact is, James Hampton III isn't even real. He's just a character, you know, invented by an author, you know, that they can't, that can't seem to get published. So, you know, that name isn't even real. But he did actually go by another name at one point when he was doing spoken word, and that name was J.B. Stillwater. And it's a name that's solid, you know, in and of itself. So I can't add no, you know, triple thing into it. It's just what it is. It's called it's J B Stillwater. That's the name. And I and I, yeah. And that's it. So you want your triple designation to not be tripley? I'm sorry, but that's unacceptable within well, the terms. Well, that's okay with me. That's <laughs> fine. I can't, you know, I can't do anything with the name. It is what it is. Okay. Well, would you like to think of a different name to, to add on to your triple designation? What's something that really uh, is, that makes you excited? Something that you're really passionate about? I would not. Are you okay with that, boss? <laughs> that's what the man wants to do. That's fine with me. All right. That's fine. I won't. If you don't want to... And he doesn't want to take the oath. You don't want to take the oath neither. So therefore, he, I can't even make it official. And we won't make it official. Mm. So Green card status. It's that <laughs> furry part that gets me. I'm like, what is that about? <laughs> well, I mean, it's fine. It's you know what? Hey, here's the here's the beautiful part about it. In Triple Nation, Triple Nation, you know, around Triple Nation, there are always going to be these republics. <laughs> 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 
you know what I mean? the triple nation. <laughs> and even, you know, even And, they, and, and so on the Republic of Stillwater. <laughs> The islands, <laughs> international water. The yeah. island Stillwater. There resides. <laughs> what you say? What you say? Archipelago. Yeah, 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 yeah. There yeah, you yeah. Go. The isthmus. Do, do I have diplomatic immunity? Can I do whatever I want? Say whatever I want? You can do whatever you want over there. <laughs> right. Yeah. Don't, bring that mess yeah. Don't bring that mess to Tribal Nation, you, son. You see how cool I'm being. I'll always be cool in your Don't presence. bring that mess to Tribal Nation. Respect son. to Tribal Nation. All right, man. Mm. <laughs> Somebody check his passports. All right. Uh, <laughs> Stamp revoked. Okay. <laughs> um, we did uh, advertise that we were going to be featuring the work of Jason Hay all the way from uh, London, England. Uh, he had a, a project called The Day That I Cross Paths with a Trickster, but it actually is an, an audio story. Um, and we were unable to get the file uh, so that we could play, and I was unable to uh, make connections with Jason, but I did put a link to his story out there on on Twitter, and I'll also put it in the show notes and also up on Facebook uh, later on. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a short audio story. I, I to, to read it, I don't think I would do it do it justice because it kind of goes all, it, it goes different places and it has like musical accompaniment, so that kind of like brings it to life, so I don't want to do it discredit. But uh, you definitely want to check it out. The Day That I Crossed the Path with a Trickster uh, by Jason Hay. And it's up there on Twitter at uh, Black Tribbles. Um, check that out as part of Octavia City. Next week, week four in Octavia City. Oh boy, now it's going, it's going to get fun. We're going to have some more reading, some more poet, some more poetry. We're also going to have the first of one of our script Screen readings. Yes. yes, one of our screenplays. We're going to have script readings. Uh, Ari, you will be here next week, correct? So uh, you're going to have to. You, we're going to have to make arrangements for you to get here on, on time next week because we're going to need you to voice. One of our voices on, uh, in this in the play next week. Okay, I could do that. I could right. do that. Rashida, will you be here next week? Yeah. All right. So, so, so we're going to get scripts to you. Kennedy is actually going through all of the scripts. She's going to be doling out the parts to everyone. Yes. Uh, I so. get to wear my casting director hat. Yeah. So <laughs> it's obnoxious. <laughs> it's so, kidding. It's about to get. It's about to really get fun here in Octavia City, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for checking it out. This show will be available for your download and streaming pleasure. Come to morn on blacktribbles.com. Also on iTunes, where I invite you to not only to subscribe to the Black Tribbles, but also leave a uh, rating or a, a, a nice little commentary uh, about the show. The show will also be available in the morning on SoundCloud so that you can go and share it all over as much as you like, as much as you've been sharing uh, week one and week two of Octavia City. We really appreciate all the feedback that we've been getting uh, uh, from everyone out there. Uh, feel free to leave us a comment as well. We know we've been sharing it and, and popping in that you love it, but nice to hear your feedback, your comments, uh, what you have to work. We love your comments. I'm just going to put this out there just real quick because we're trying to go. You guys love us. Well, guess what? We love feedback. Holla at us. If you're watching us on YouTube, please comment on those videos. Whatever it is you want to say, say it. If you love us on the air, hit us up on iTunes. Hit us up on SoundCloud. Let those people know that you love us like we love you, loving us, loving you. Because yes. that's how that's how triples work. It's it's only Cyrano Chosen says it's the only <laughs> love that money can't buy. That's right. All right, so, so ladies and gentlemen, for uh, for Storm Trouble, <laughs> for Storm Trouble, for Chitara Trouble, for Ast Astral Trouble, and Drama and Trouble. Drama trouble. Ah, I knew it was an Astral Trouble. I, I knew it was an Astral A. Astral Trouble is Dr. Holbrook. That's right. Oh, I, I'll take that. No, you can't. Oh. That's hers. Dr. Holbrook. The, can I be her? Can I just, you just want to I be think her? all of us want to be Dr. Holbrook just for like a couple hours. <laughs> for Andromeda Tribble, for Frenchie Tribble, for Triple Sty, and for you all the way over there on the archipelago of uh, <laughs> Stillwater. Stillwater, Stillwater Bay. It's Miss Frank Wicks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is the bad trouble imparting, we say. Hailing frequencies closed, Captain. Peace. <laughs>